So good morning po everyone and welcome to panel 29 of this year's ICCS3, which will be about discourses on development in the Cordillera. I, will, I am your facilitator, I'm Vlad Bumatay, profe Assistant Professor of Philosophy at the Department of History and Philosophy, College of Social Sciences, UP Baguio. So in this panel, we will hear three presentations. So the first presentation is entitled, Rethinking Appropriate Urban Development, Advocating for Alternatives in a Philippine in Wholesale Market Trade by Professors Lynn Milgram and Professor uh, Laurelie Mendoza. The second presentation is entitled, Historicizing the Bliss Concepts Transformation in Genesis, 1989 to 1994 by Ms. Jiraya Gray. And our third presentation is entitled, uh, Pig, Pig, uh, Piga di Nabitag, Reflecting on the Poverty Statistics Among Indigenous Peoples in the Cordillera by Aldrin Federico Bahit Jr. Before we proceed to the uh, panel presentation, let me just remind for the audience of this session uh, for the following rules. So the first one is to please unmute your microphone so that we could minimize the noise that, we'll, that, we, that might enter in our Zoom meeting. Number two is to please turn off your camera. <clears throat> and three, do not cross talk while the speakers are presenting. You can use the Zoom feature of raising your hand if you want to ask a question later on in the Q&A session, and the moderator will, uh, will recognize you. The last reminder is for uh, the certificates. So, so the certificates will be given after the conference. So without further ado, we can now proceed to the first presentation by professors Milgram and Mendoza. Uh, let me just introduce our speakers. Professor Lynn Milgram is a professor of anthropology at UCAD University, Toronto. Her research in the Northern Philippines analyzes the cultural politics of social change regarding women's work in crafts, the secondhand clothing trade, and street and public market vending. Milgram investigates urban public space transformations and issues of informality, government, governmentality, and extralegality regarding livelihood rights and food security. New projects analyze social enterprise development in Philippine crafts and coffee. Milgram has co-edited five books, including uh, Street Economics of the Urban Global South, Recent publications include Gift Commodity Entanglements in a Philippine Market Trade and Refashioning Philippine Street Foods and Vending. And vending. Uh, to, our, to the co-author of this presentation, Professor Lori Lee Crisologo Mendoza is a retired professor of economics at the College of the Social Sciences of UP Baguio. She obtained a doctorate in economics from the Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium in 1997. She has conducted research on livelihoods of farming households in Cordillera communities, gender and household economics, local governance and local resource managed practices. So we can now hear the video presentation of professors Milgram and Mendoza. Hello and welcome. I'm Lynn Milgram, and I'm pleased to present this paper on behalf of Laura Lee Mendoza and myself as co-authors. Our paper is entitled, Rethinking Appropriate Urban Development, Advocating for Alternatives in a Philippine Wholesale Market Trade. The first slide you see here is a map locating the city of La Trinidad, with which most of you, as we know, are familiar. And this is the home of the wholesale vegetable market we're discussing here today. Benguet provincial newspapers repeatedly report on the well-being of the region's extensive wholesale trade in highland vegetables, as this industry substantially contributes to the provincial economy. 
Central to this trade is the La Trinidad Vegetable Trading Post, the region's major wholesale vegetable market located in La Trinidad, then gets capital. Reports describe the market as home to hundreds of traders and buyers. The local trading post is a jump off point for the transport of highland vegetables to the lowlands and represents the biggest income generating endeavor of the municipal government, end of quote. Thus, in preparation for the 2016 ASEAN Free Trade Agreement, which would open Philippine borders to vegetable imports from ASEAN nations, in 2013, the Benguet Provincial Government began construction on the Benguet Agri Pinoy Trading Center. This vegetable wholesale facility is three times the size of the current La Trinidad Vegetable Trading Post, and it's mandated to streamline the flow of vegetables from producer to consumer. In early 2016, when the then mayor ordered the original trading post to be closed, jeopardizing people's livelihoods, traders resisted this one size fits all marketing plan by submitting petitions and publicly protesting. When the then mayor of La Trinidad failed to be reelected in May 2016, city officials took no further action to close the trading post, which continues to conduct business as usual along with the underutilized Baptiste site located just across town. As evidenced with the Baptiste mega project, traveling neoliberal models of appropriate urban development tend to favor constructing large scale complexes and privatizing public space agendas that are usually unaccommodating of urban poor and even middle class needs. Many cities are thus being sanitized through evictions and other face lifting measures intended to eliminate undesirable remnants of so called traditional trade that often encompass informally negotiated and extra legal modes of organization. In so doing, officials disrupt informally spatialized commodity flows that have provisioned consumers, producers, and traders for generations. By capturing such alternative economic practices, the last frontier for capital expansion, governments feel they can extract value from them, often resulting in struggles over land, livelihood rights, and access to urban resources. So this paper that we're presenting here today engages these issues, and we have a number of questions that we are asking. To what extent can La Trinidad Vegetable Trading Post wholesalers secure their provisioning livelihoods given government's modernizing agenda? Through what channels do trading post wholesalers leverage their informalized and not yet legal practices to sustain their commodity chain networks? And third, to what effect has the municipal and provincial governments facilitated, regularized, or constrained trading post operations? that trading post marketers have regularized their informal tactics through repeated practice and that the municipal government has enabled these ad hoc actions by collecting additional administrative fees, we argue, evidences that both the city and traders are complicit in using informality and extra legality as urban organizing logic when it is to both their mutual advantage. To situate the trading post shifting trajectories within this broader political framework, we draw first on the scholarship advocating for a diverse and inclusive cityness. And you can see some of the authors here. This approach establishes a more broadly oriented re-territorialization to recognize the complexity of cities and urbanites needs in what Brenner terms, quote, a reflexive city following how products flow through each trade node from production to distribution to consumption highlights the gray spaces of commodity chain flows and how multiple interactions at all levels can generate new effects not traceable to any one system of provisioning. So with this very brief context in mind, let us move on to discuss the trading post operation. La Trinidad, as you know, with a population of 150,000, is the capital city of Benguet province, which, positioned at 1,500 meters, is the Philippine hub for the wholesale collection, 
sale, and distribution of temperate climate vegetables. The La Trinidad Trading Post is organized into five trading sectors plus administrative offices. So these include the main trading or Baksakan area occupied by self-employed wholesalers that you see here, two lanes on either side of the main trading area, which are reserved for farmers to deliver their produce, the parking area to load goods, and there's stalls located along the perimeter, which are rented usually by farmer cooperatives. So the main trading area, a covered 15 by 75 meter concrete platform with open sides, houses the trade of fixed site wholesalers who pay 50 pesos a day in rent for their spaces. As formal as these rented selling sites are intended to be, wholesalers can create gray spaces of trade by expanding the sites they occupy or subletting part of the space depending upon the volume of that day's deliveries and orders. The market code outlines that sales are restricted to the wholesale trade of Highland vegetables. But traders conducting business from the center aisle that you see here sell mixed vegetables in smaller volume retail sales, as well as lowland rather than highland produce. So these center island retail merchants can purchase small quantities of vegetables directly from farmers, while also purchasing highland vegetables from their neighboring wholesalers conducting business right next door. These retail sales not only contravene the market code, but they also jeopardize the livelihoods of the vegetable retailers operating businesses in the city's public market just down the street. So we have a lot of operations here that are expanding our elastic borders of what is legal and what is formal or informal. And let me go on and illustrate this with some case studies. Rosalind, in her mid-50s, who you see here, started her business at the Trading Post in 1995 and hires three full-time employees. Focusing on cauliflower and green onions, to be specific, Rosalind's wholesale trade strategies are similar to those of other full-time trading post merchants. Rosalind purchases the majority of her produce directly from farmers and to ensure she obtains the quality and quantity of goods she needs, she advances inputs, seeds, fertilizer, pesticides, rather than cash to her approximately 20 trusted farmer suppliers. Farmers deliver their cauliflower to Rosalind already packed in plastic sacks, sorted by quality. Rosalind weighs the sacks and pays farmers accordingly, including paying for the weight of the outer green leaves as a bonus, because these leaves are usually trimmed before selling. If there's a discrepancy in product quality, Rosalind discusses this issue with the farmer in the next delivery, explaining, quote, we need to maintain a mutual understanding of trust to benefit both our businesses, end of quote. Although the practice in which traders advance inputs to farmers can potentially increase farmers' vulnerability, such advances simultaneously function as a social safety net, providing farmers with cash for unexpected expenses, given the lack of formal government support, such as crop insurance and health insurance. Losing this access is one reason why farmers hesitate to take their produce to new larger Baptiste site. The complexity of such transactions emerges moreover when one considers the accompanying dark sides of social capital, such as the potential for downward leveling norms on product prices and unreasonable claims of allegiance on group members if producers remain in debt to marketers. Yet farmers can employ everyday politics to negotiate more advantageous agreements for themselves. And this they do, such as withholding products that are in demand. And farmers also can access up-to-date market prices now by consulting their cell phone apps, as well as new electronic boards, both of which you see here and are being uh, featured in the market sites. Rosalind sells approximately a thousand 
kilos of cauliflower per day, most of which are pre-ordered by regular Manila clients. Within this national trade, however, a personal gesture comes into play because Rosalind sorts the cauliflower according to size and condition of trimming depending on the buyer's wish. And she trims them using four particular styles. Rosalind additionally explains that if she receives an order she cannot fill, she will purchase produce from her fellow marketers or subcontract collection to itinerant traders. Although the latter tactics constrain her profit margin, Rosalind can maintain the allegiance of her buyers by completing their orders. Similarly, to maintain a farmer's loyalty, Rosalind purchases extra stock that the farmer may have, hoping to sell it on speculation. These alternative to mainstream economic tactics are all informally arranged and are all set to maintain relations of trust. While fixed site wholesalers like Roslyn form the core of daily trading activity, a range of part-time traders conduct trade from any sanctioned site in the outer farmer's lane. When a legal site is not available, these periodic traders operationalize gray and extra legal spaces of trade by conducting business in the market, adjacent streets, or even in its parking lot, contravening market code guidelines. Periodic wholesalers trade only when their farmer contacts have produce to deliver or when these peri periodic wholesalers receive orders from their buyers. Irene, for example, 38 years old, conducts business at the trading post two to four days a week. Like many mobile traders, Irene does not specialize in a specific type of vegetable, but rather she sells the seasonal produce her family farmers harvest, as well as purchasing vegetables from other producers for specific orders. As Irene explains, quote, in my in-between position, my challenge is to access the process I need in sufficient quantities for the orders I anticipate receiving, end of quote. John, another part-time trader you see here, secures his business by giving inputs to farmers, forming what he calls a partnership with them. In this situation, John explains, quote, a trader owns part of the harvest and earns income accordingly. I am working on commission such that we both have an investment to protect. If the crop fails, we both lose, end of quote. Only by fostering relations of trust and confidence in interlocking often informal supply chains can both permanent and itinerant traders ensure receiving the goods they need when they need them and the quality they seek. Thus, what appears as a linear commodity flow from farmer to consumer is in effect a multi-stranded sourcing chain that expands, contracts, and twists as needed. So in conclusion, despite ongoing urbanization and a potential government market redevelopment plan that promised certain demise for the La Trinidad vegetable trading post, this wholesale market's viability and popularity endures as an essential source of provisioning for farmers, traders, buyers, and consumers. The resultant complexity of the trading post wholesale food provisioning system thus highlights the futility of crafting urban development after a model that potentially jeopardizes livelihoods and consumption options across social and economic sectors. Understanding cities, as Robinson suggests, as multiplex and internally differentiated spaces, encompassing relations that span interaction and disconnection, highlights the diversity of ordinary cities and how urbanites such as trading post wholesalers can use their voice to more advantageously craft the character of their work. That trading post players have effectively sustained 
and diversified patterns of fresh food provisioning in the face of government constraints, such as the Baptisi mega project, evidences how conflict and reconciliation, civic engagement, and everyday politics can be negotiated when competing ideologies clash over rights to livelihood, marketplace modernization, and the best way to facilitate a quality of life for and by its residents. Laura Lee Mendoza and I wish to thank you for your attention. We both very much enjoyed working together on this project. Um, in some degree, our research may continue. So on behalf of both Laura Lee and myself, thank you. Thank you, Professor Milgram and Professor Mendoza for that uh, interesting presentation of yours. Uh, we could now proceed to the second presentation for this panel, which is entitled Piga di Nabitag, reflecting on the poverty statistics among indigenous peoples in the Cordillera by Mr. Aldrin Federico Bahit Jr. Mr. Bahit Jr. is the chief statistical specialist and officer in charge of the statistical operations and coordination division, regional statistical services office, Cordillera administrative region, Philippine Statistics Authority. Good morning. I am uh, Aldrin Federico Bahit Jr. And I'm going to present to you um, my uh, paper. It's entitled Piga di Nabiteg, Reflecting on the Poverty Statistics Among Indigenous Peoples in the Cordillera. Piga di Nabiteg is a Tantanai word, um, meaning uh, where is the poor? Goal one of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development is to end poverty in all its forms everywhere. A specific target under this goal is to reduce by 2030 at least half the proportion of population living in poverty in all its dimensions according to national definitions. So with the pledge to leave no one behind, it is an added commitment to include an overarching principle of data disaggregation by income, by sex, age, race, ethnicity, migratory status, disability, geographic location, whenever relevant. Gillette Hall and Ariel Gandolfo said that present in over 90 countries, indigenous communities represent about 5% of the world's population but make up 15% of the world's extreme poor and one third of the rural poor. Wherever they live, indigenous peoples face distinct pressures, including being among the poorest and most marginalized in their societies. They said indigenous peoples are poorer everywhere. However, even uh, the Philippine Statistics Authority, the agency mandated to release the official poverty statistics of the country, uh, aside from being the official, uh, official repository of sustainable development goal statistics, the monetary-based measure of poverty is disaggregated by location, regions and provinces, and by basic sectors. However, ethnicity is uh, by uh, ethnicity variable is not part of it. We have only fishermen, farmers, children, women, youth, senior citizens, migrants, and formal sector workers and urban poor. So that leads me to this question. How many are poor among the indigenous population in the Cordillera? Uh, it is a rough um, answer to, to this question. And what I did is uh, look at the 2010 Census of Population and Housing Ethnicity Variable, the ethno-linguistic groups, and look at the percentages of IP population to the regional and provincial population. And uh, juxtaposed it with the full year 2018 official poverty statistics. I'm going to also present to you the 2015 um, poverty statistics in comparison so that we would know how the region um, fared with poverty reduction. And then I looked. Uh, and I did the ratio of the magnitude or number of poor population 
to the percentage of IP population derived from the 2020, uh, 2010 census of population and housing. By the way, uh, today, July 26, is uh, the Regional Dissemination Forum for the uh, results of the 2020 Census of Population and Housing. And uh, uh, it's going to be uh, um, only the uh, basic uh, pop population uh, statistics, the total number of the population for the Philippines, the regions, the provinces, the municipalities, and the barangays. But uh, we are still uh, doing the uh, tabulations of all the other variables of the census of population and housing. Now, for the poverty, poverty incidence of the Cordillera, uh, the poverty incidence among population decreased by 10.4 percentage points. This, this is good news. So from 22.6% in uh, 2015 to 12.2% in 2018. Uh, by the way, the, uh, uh, the uh, official poverty statistics of the Philippines, uh, we based it from the Family Income and Expenditure Survey uh, that is being uh, done every three years. So that's the reason why our poverty statistics are every three years as well. So from 2015 to 2018, this meant a uh, reduction of uh, about 25,000 per person in 2018 compared to an estimated 23,000 individuals that graduated from being poor in 2015. So when we see the cluster of provinces in the Cordillera 2015 and 2018, we cluster them from one to four, uh, cluster one being the poorest cluster. So we see here that uh, Abra uh, improved from cluster three to cluster four from uh, poverty incidence of 19.9 to 15% uh, in 2018. Apayao, um, from 38.1% to 16%, so from cluster two to cluster three. Then get um, still in cluster five. Cluster five yeah, indicates the least poor provinces. And uh, Ifugao, Kalinga, and Mountain, uh, Ifugao and Kalinga, uh, they jumped uh, two clusters from cluster two to cluster four. And Mountain Province from cluster two to cluster three. So basically, if we're going to map it, we have a better picture of the poverty situation in the Cordillera administ in administrative region in 2018. So we could see the improvement overall. Now, if we're going to uh, look at the number of IP uh, in the methodology that I did. <clears throat> so for the uh, total 216,210 estimated poor individuals in the Cordillera administrative region, since Kankanaois are the uh, dominant uh, IP in the Cordillera, they would number um, 37,000 <clears throat> uh, as estimated. And next are the Kalinga, Ibaloy, and Ifugao. And uh, the non-indigenous ethnic groups uh, about 33% in the whole region. <clears throat> so basically, the Cordillera administrative region is an IP region. We have predominantly IP population of, uh, <clears throat> of more than uh, uh, 60%. We go to Abra. So uh, when we go to the provinces, so Abra uh, is predominantly non-indigenous uh, 
uh, ethnic group in, in, in Abra, uh, about 69%. And the uh, predominant uh, IP group there in Abra is Indian. So if you're going to apply the ratio for the number of IP, the percentage of IP um, to the uh, total uh, poor population in Abra, Indians will have approximately 4,620 poor, um, poor population. So uh, followed by white, well, uh, far behind is Kankanai. It's only 0.1% of the population of Abra. Now let's go to Apayao. Apayao is predominantly Isnag, 32.4%. Uh, and if we put that ratio to the uh, total uh, provincial poor population of 24,000, they would be approximately 8,000, approximately 8,000 poor Isnags. There. So uh, almost half of the population is non-indigenous in the province of Apayao. Now let's go to Benguet. Benguet is predominantly Kankanae, followed by Ibaloy. Almost 45% uh, are Kankanae and 30% are Ibaloys. So if we are going to put number on the poor population of the IP group, about 18,000 Kankanaois and about 12,000 for Ibaloys. And the rest are flashed on the screen. Benguet is um, predominantly IP with only 11.6% non-indigenous population. For the city of Baguio, um, it's like Abra, but uh, it's more non-indigenous uh, ethnic groups, the population, it's 60.2%. And uh, most of the IPs in Baguio are Kankanaois, 11.6% or 11.7%, and followed by Ibadois. Apply and apply. And for the province of Ifugao, it's uh, predominantly IP, 63.3% are Ifugao. If we're going to apply the ratio, about 19% or 19,000 are poor Ifugao and 3,000 Kalanguya. For the province of Kalinga, Again, province of Kaninga is predominantly IP population. 19.7% um, uh, are non-indigenous ethnic groups. Kaninga is the uh, uh, major ethnic group, 65.8%. And the total estimated uh, poor population in Kalinga is 26,890. And uh, I estimated that 17,687 are poor Kalingas. For Mountain Province, 5.3% are non indigenous population. We have uh, predominantly Kankanaoy, and uh, followed by Apply, Bontok, and Balangao. So these are the numbers that uh, I estimate the number of poor IPs according to ethnic linguistic group. So that is uh, my simple answer, rough answer to how many are poor in the Cordillera and what are the uh, effects of this or um, or how is it connected to the sustainable development goals? Basically, um, impoverished communities unaware of the errant harmful ways in which they use natural resources 
such as forest, wood, and soil, are continuing the destructive cycle that spirals the environment further downward. Air pollution is another way in which poverty contributes to environmental degradation from Shante Owens. So how does poverty affect sustainability? It's uh, affecting uh, environmental sustainability. It's also affecting uh, cultural sustainability. Um, when you say, when I say cultural sustainability, people will be leaving their own, um, their villages to go uh, look for work outside and uh, their indigenous practices could uh, actually suffer from that because of out migration. So this is monetary measure of poverty and uh, the economic sustainability of the uh, um, of the families of the IPs are very important and it has a very big bearing in the future of the IP community. The 2020 census of population and housing ethnicity data, um, we have also that, and uh, we have been partnering with uh, the National, uh, National Commission, Commission for Indigenous People, NCIP. And uh, we have, uh, they have helped us in uh, uh, coming up with the uh, ethnicity questions for the census of population and housing. And this will be tabulated with other data items and disaggregated data on demographic, socioeconomic, and housing characteristics. So they will be produced soon. So we have only released the basic uh, population data, but we will um, release the um, uh, the tabulation of all these things uh, later on. However, uh, I am not still quite sure if we could, from the census of population and housing, we could we could have a disaggregation of uh, how poor uh, are the IPs versus the non-IPs because the family income and expenditure survey is our source for the for the estimation of the official poverty statistics of the Philippines. So these are, or this is my, um, my suggestion, is that uh, it, uh, we should include ethnicity variable in the family income expenditure survey. Uh, we do it every three years. So we are doing it right now, actually. Um, the uh, enumeration for the family income and expenditure survey, the first visit, for the first semester of 2021. Uh, currently, we are doing it. And, uh, but uh, there is no ethnicity variable there yet. And one of uh, um, the statistical project or yeah, that we could uh, put ethnicity variable in is the community-based monitoring system. We are going to pilot uh, the CBMS this year as well. Um, this October, um, but uh, we could improve, of course, with that pilot, we could improve, uh, we could add more variables for the CBMS. So these are um, the surveys and the statistical project that we can put ethnicity variables uh, in, and we could look at and um, say, or the Jews, or uh, tell if the IPs are really poorer than the nine, the non IPs, especially. But here in the Cordillera Administrative Region, well, uh, the IPs here, I guess, would would have a different uh, um, story compared to other IPs in the Philippines. So that needs to be seen, and that needs to be answered as well. So uh, that's it for my presentation, uh, my, uh, my simple paper in answer to the question, Piga di nabitin, na imbag na bigat kadatayo amin.
thank you, Mr. Bahit Jr. for that uh, presentation. Uh, we could now proceed to the last presentation entitled Historicizing the Bliss Concepts Transformation in Genesis 1989-1994 by Ms. Jiraya Gray. Uh, Ms. Jiraya Gray finished her BA in Social Sciences as a cum laude with a major in History at the University of the Philippines, Baguio. She now teaches there as an instructor in history. As an undergraduate, she took keen interest in arenas of development that enmesh Baguio City, urban history, post-disaster rehabilitation, national development administration, and the local regional history of the Cordillera administrative region. These research curiosities and the able guidance of her advisor, Dr. Ramon Rovillos, resulted in her BA thesis, Historicizing the Bliss Concept Transformation in Genesis. This will be the basis for her paper presentation. Hi, um, good morning po to everyone here today. My name is Jiraya Gray, an instructor from the University of the Philippines, Baguio. And today I will be presenting um, a paper which, which is based on my ill-formed undergraduate thesis. So apologies in advance if there are any things that need to be corrected. But uh, the title is Defining Development at the Margins, A Political History of the Bliss Concepts, Genesis and Transformation from 1989 to 1994. Now, for those of us here who don't really know what the Bliss Plan is, um, let me give you an idea of how it has been defined. Now, the Blist concept is an urban planning metropolitan development idea, a mouthful, and we'll explain what that is later, that integrates the areas of Baguio, La Trinidad, Itogon, Sablan, Tuba, and with the inclusion of Tublay in 2009, under a common administrative planning zone, rather than a unified political structure. This planning unit has been envisioned to serve as the platform to distribute educational and infrastructural services to LIST and help ease the urban sprawl in Baguio City. So supposedly development here is twofold. It helps to uh, improve the development area, uh, the urban capacities of LIST, as well as redistribute some services away from Baguio City. From a wider historical scope, the BLIST has been consistently identified by Cordillera Administrative Regional Development Plans as its primary urban growth center since the late 1980s up until the present day. So when we talk about the BLIST plan as a metropolitan development idea, it actually has uh, significance not only on the local scale, but also on the regional scale. Because the idea is, if you develop one urban center, then you are able to supply more services to the regional whole and potentially also um, encourage development in other urban centers pa around the region. Now, this isn't to say that this is the only development or urban spatial development strategy for GAR, but it has been consist consistently mentioned as the most important one, um, at least for the period under study po. Ano. So here's an idea of the BLIST's continuing prominence. In 2016, Baguio City Congressman Marquez Mark Go submitted House Bill 1544, which lobbies for the creation of a Baguio La Trinidad Itogon Sablan Tubatublay Development Authority, or the BLIST DA, with the power to oversee urban spatial development concerns over essential basic needs services for the area. In the bill, this includes transportation, hazard mitigation, sewage and pollution, water supply, and other aspects of urban living. So in addition to spreading out certain services like educational services and you know roads and infrastructure, um, the other purpose of, a, of the BLIST plan would be to come up with a common way to administer these kinds of needs within that shared metropolitan space. Now, this may seem very kind of cold, detached, very bureaucratic, but underlying it is a very important question. In studying the history of de development concepts such as this, 
we we can't help but return to the politics of asking who gets to develop uh, who gets to define development for the Philippine margins, especially in a place like the Cordillera Administrative Region, where its formation in the very first place was a result of increased clamor for uh, political participation on the ground when it comes to development projects. We recall, for example, the controversy over the Chico Dam project, which was an international uh, international a nationally defined um, regional development priority. So there was a clamor for local and regionally defined priorities for the region itself. So yun, kung yun yung context ng um, development in the Cordilleras, how do we kind of locate the bliss planning process and who got to define development in this case um, in relation to that history? So yeah, today, this, this is what you want to do. Um, I will give you a very brief conceptual backdrop, and then we're going to talk about the history of the BLIST and uh, look at some conclusions. So for the conceptual backdrop, I looked at three areas where I could um, extract questions. Now, for the sake of saving time, we're not going to look at exactly what these areas are. Um, but if you are from them, you would already be familiar with what they entail as disciplines. But I will show you the, the questions that I um, pulled from these areas of study. So from urban development studies, I formed the question, what was the BLIST as an urban development concept and how did it figure into the goals of local national development planning in the Philippines? So nakita natin na hindi lang regional ay hindi lang local pero regional and even national yung significance ng bliss plan so we'll see how it was conceptualized later from public administration studies the question was okay if there are development plans such as this and when they enter the philippine political system they need sponsorship or support from different stakeholders then in the case of the bliss concept how did it move forward who carried it and how did it morph according to the uh, political setting at the time. Now, from disaster studies, naman, the question that I pulled was: um, while the Cordillera was trying, the Cordillera region was trying to develop, and the Blist had been identified as a major node of urban spatial development, um, paano na affect yung process nato by the 1990 earthquake, which hit Luzon? Uh, and had very devastating effects on the core of that metropolitan area, that being Baguio City. But of course, all the other areas of list were very deeply affected as well. So how did this affect the bliss planning process? And moving forward, what new definitions um, emerged? So first, let's try to define development. Um, development by the uh, administration planning scholar de Guzman in 1987 was defined by process in which resources are put to better use in a country, a region, or a sector of society, emphasizing that the term better requires, an explanation of how and for whom a particular way of using resources is more advantageous than others. So it's actually inherently political because we, when we try to understand the development goals, objectives, and priorities of any given society, we then have to ask who determines them, including the extent of participation of the people in general and how they are formulated. And when we want to trace the configurations of that political process, we can look at something called the political system. Now, this is one of the first iterations or versions in political science of the political system. And the basic idea is you have inputs, which are demands, which have support. So here's the bliss plan. Here's the bliss plan. Someone has to support it so that it continues to survive. It enters the political planning process and it is spit out as a decision, a policy, or something that is institutionalized or part of our long-term plans. So ito yung outputs natin. Now, through different events that happen, whether that's disasters or major um, political events, nagkakaroon ng feedback loop, which leads people to question or improve upon or even scrap some of the initial policies, decisions, and plans that they came up with. So paikot-ikot lang to. Um, in the case of the BLIST, I wanted to look at how two particular events, in this case, the creation of CAR, in 1987 and the Luzon earthquake in 1990 affected the versions of the BLIST concept that should be churned out. Here we have a summary of the kinds of people and actors who, 
who threw in support for the Blist plan in order for it to survive through the many years it has survived. And I tried to look at this process within the context, a context of local, regional, and national, international development planning. So ano ba yung trends at the time, ano yung considerations, at paano, uh, paano to na integrate sa Blist planning process. Okay, so given the trend towards decentralization and regionalization in the creation of laws and in academic theorization since the 1970s, when naging matunog sa Pilipinas yung urbanization and regionalization, how did those shifts intellectually and legally manifest on the ground in our local and regional settings? Now, my argument today is some of the answers lie in the history of the bliss especially when we look at its history after 1987 up until 1994. Now, uh, these are our objectives for today. Now, the primary sources used for this, and in history, medyo iba yung def definition naman of primary sources, pero um, these are basically yung mga materials that show us the inception of certain um, historical events. In this case, the creation of the Bliss Plan can be seen through the Baguio and Dagupan Urban Planning Project documents, um, various regional development plans for Baguio, I uh, regional, so for the Cordilleras, which talk about the bliss, you no, know, and other newspaper articles from newspapers such as the Gold Ore, Baguio Midland Courier, and Baguio Cordillera Post. So taking these together, um, I was able to form a rough picture of how the bliss planning process took place on the ground. Now, here's a summary of the blist concepts through time. We actually have four. Well, three, pero binalikan kasi yung isang old concept. Eh. Kaya ginawa ko na lang four um, if we look at it through, through their emergence in time. Now, very briefly here, the first version of the concept emerged in about 1989. Um, may nagsasabi na 1988, pero wala pa kasi ako na documents that say that. So, I stuck to what I could find in official documents. So, during this time, pinapost ng CAR National Economic and Development Authority, or NEDA, uh, and the Regional Land Use Community Committee as a primary development area for the region. So, later we'll see what exactly Metro Baguio was, but at the time, in terms of the rhetoric or the um, way that they formed it, Baguio really was at the center of, of the development process very explicitly. So in 1990, because of the 1990 Luzon earthquake na rin, um, nag-emerge yung Metro Blist or Blist Biadap concept naman. So nakita ng mga tao yung initial Metro Baguio concept as a way to rehabilitate Benguet. And they didn't like it. Uh, so for various reasons that we'll look at later. Na valid din naman yung considerations. So, ang ginawa nila ay, they repackaged Metro Baguio as Blist and they made it part of an urban-rural development strategy as part of the post-1990 quake rehabilitation um, process for Benguet. Now, very shortly after, no, um, release yung uh, 1993 to 1998 Regional Development Plan at pag titignan natin yung document na yun, bumalik na naman tayo sa concept of the Metro Baguio Development Project. So it was also a way to rehabilitate Benguet, pero wala nang mention of the integrated area development component or yung biada part, yung rural component ng plan. So na-drop yun, pero the bliss remains. Now, uh, you have a divergence here between local planning and, in a way, internationally sponsored planning. So may pumasok na isang very important stakeholder, and that is the European Community-Funded Baguio and Dagupan Urban Planning Project. So this was composed of European architects, urban planners, but also some Filipino architects. I think there were two um, Philippine, agent, Philippine architectural agencies that were part of the plan, as well as local consultants. So, ayun, yung naging product ng study na yun ay yung 1994 Blist Urban Master Structure Plan, which continues to form the core of the Blist concept up until the present day. So, um, we don't have a lot of time now, so I'm only going to breeze through the, the definitions here. Here is a visualization of the areas included in Blist, including the Tublay. So, ayan. When we look at the first metropolitan 
concept for bliss. It was really Metropolitan Baguio. At pre-napose to, uh, to be parang the main urban development node for the Cordilleras. So, the reason why they chose Baguio and La Trinidad, or Baguio in general, because it was was because it was the most urban space. And then they chose List because they were the areas around Baguio, as we saw from the map here. No? So, yun yung tinatawag nilang ecology-based expanded development of Baguio City. Ano yung strengths ng iba't ibang areas na to, and how can we develop those strengths in support of the growth of this urban space? So, a metropolitan arrangement is actually an urban spatial strategy where a highly urbanized city and local government units around it enter a cooperative venture in planning and implementing urban development activities. So, minsan, nagkakaroon ng bagong political structure surrounding that unit, like in the case of Metro Manila. Uh, but in our case, it was really more of an administrative structure. So, there would be a common body that determined um, plans and often that body is composed of mayors from these areas. So, um, yes, I can't say much about that now. But basically, the idea, the purpose of this was to provide for the urban renewal of metropolitan Baguio by providing a wider space to accommodate the increasing growth of the city, including the necessary urban amenities. Because it was envisioned as the commercial and major urban center of the Cordillera, the provider of first-level commercial and service facilities that will cater not only to residents of the region but to tourists as well. Now, these services include um, Baguio as the center for several government functions for the region, um, it being an educational center, an economics hub as well with many headquarters, regional headquarters here, and so on and so forth. So, there are several specific descriptions mentioned here, but we can't go through them anymore. Um, what I can say is, the reason why, uh, at the time, they thought of Metro Baguio as one of the main development strategies for CAR is because in the period... Um, the government, the national government was encouraging urbanization and regionalization. So for additional studies on this, you can see Pernia and Pedranga from 1983 and Mercado from 2002, um, who all tackle the question of urban development in the Philippines. So when this new region, the Cordillera Administrative Region, was formed, the question was, how do we drive development for this area? And the answer lied in the development context at the time. Now, um... There are descriptions here of why exactly it was the Cordillera, why exactly it was Baguio. Uh, we have statistics on the urban population ratio, pero we're just gonna breeze past that for now. Um, what it what is important to note here is with the initial introduction of the concept by Neda Carr, uh, we find a level of continuity in that institution carrying the idea forward despite the um, challenges it would it would face in the next. Mm, months. So here's the timeline for the first turning point and the important developments related to the BLIST. No? Neda Carr supported the BLIST idea so deeply that they actually, right before the 1990 earthquake, they submitted it for um, funding under something called the Philippine Assistance Program. Now at the time, in terms of the Philippine political system dispersing development funds, you have something called the PAP through which all of the um, aid from other countries is passed through. So, they collect the aid that na they for example, from the U European community, from the US, from Japan, into the Philippine Assistance Program. Tapos from that mass of funds, they allocate it to other projects that have been proposed by usually the NEDAs of different regions. So, they've na sa the level of um, national scope yung blist right before the 1990 earthquake. So, in July 1990, the earthquake hits, and then you have these problems which emerge afterwards. So, uh, you have an increase in public participation in the negotiation of the concept. You also have um, the introduction of a new international player in defining the blist plan. So, while you have that level of support, you also have a level of resistance. And the resistance comes from two things. One, people don't know um, if there's going to be a new political uh, zone being implemented that will supersede the mayors. So they don't like that idea. Secondly, 
Uh, there's a question of why we should privilege urban development over rural development planning kasi syempre this project will receive funding. And why is it an urban plan that receives the most funding out of the um, parang other projects that have been proposed? So the answer was to to propose something instead that integrated yung urban and rural development planning for Benguet. And this is the bliss or Metro Bliss, Metropolitan Bliss idea, under the Bliss Biadap that we mentioned earlier. So this would integrate the other areas of um, Benguet under a rural development project, which could serve as the supply base for the urban core of Bliss. So unfortunately, um, nawala ito noong 1993 to 1998 regional development plan. There's no mention of the uh, rural development project at all. And the Metro Blist concept re-emerges as Metro Baguio with the same basic configurations as it had under the old plan. So, part na rin siya ng Northwestern Luzon Growth Quadrangle or uh, an envisioned strategy to increase agricultural growth, our uh, agricultural urban growth across northern Luzon. So, the last thing we want to look at is the Urban Blist Structure Plan. Now, because of the funding that had come in, and di ba, nagka-funding dahil sa 1990 earthquake, saktong nakasalang na yung Blist project. And because Baguio was one of the most devastated areas because of the earthquake, um, it became almost a natural decision to put in funding for the urban development of Baguio. And this came in the form of the Baguio and the Gupan Urban Planning Project. So a total of this much money, 20 million uh, euros, was channeled through the PAP in order to fund projects in the Philippines, the BLIST um, plan included. So, ano nga ba yung concept dito? Um, still, Victor. they were building on the idea that Baguio needed to be rebuilt in order for um, urban development in the Cordillera to continue um, flourishing. And so, the question of the BLIST plan was, how do we specifically direct urban planning in Baguio so we don't return to the pre-1990 earthquake problems of substandard uh, construction, urban sprawl, and a lack of road facilities, which a lack of facilities which really leads to the congestion of Baguio rather than the dispers dispersion of population to other areas around it. So, Ayan, madama tayong descriptions dito over what exactly this would mean. But what is important for us to note here as a last bit is um, there were eight areas that have specific plans included in the more or less seven documents provided by the BLIST um, structure plan. You have population, land, housing, employment, infrastructure, tourism, national hazards, and community facilities. Now, here's another timeline for the um, post quake history of the BLIST. Um, in conclusion, we have a couple of important things to remember here. Now, um, although there's a widening amount of political participation in the BLIST planning process, ultimately it's still a top-down process. So the top being represented by the national development arm, NEDA, in its regional configuration, which is NEDA CAR. So because of their sponsorship, hindi talaga na, na push aside yung concept ng BLIST, even when it started to undergo a lot of um, local parang backlash. So institutional support was so important in defining development in this case. And the reason why they took this particular urban development strategy is because of the context of urban and regional development at the time in the Philippines versus other rural development plans. So, uh, ayun. The... Backlash didn't really have a lot of effects on the BLIST plan in the definition of the BLIST plan. However, we can say that the implementation of the BLIST plan into an, a tangible policy or several tangible policies has been affected by um, the lack of integration in public participation into these planning processes. Imagine it's been over 25 years and we're still clamoring for the BLIST or people are still clamoring for the BLIST, even if... There have been problems that have happened along the way. The fact that it continues is because of continued sponsorship by NEDA and other related agencies. But the fact that it has not been implemented is due to the lack of that element of public participation. And my own analysis of that is the formation of CAR was contingent on 
increased development participation by local stakeholders. At hindi to talaga na reflect in the definition of BLIST initially. So questions moving forward are, in the creation of the new BLIST DA, how much participation will locals have in, in defining what that will mean for our shared future? So thank you very much. That's my presentation for today. If you have any questions, you can ask me in the last part of our session. All right, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gray, for that uh, interesting presentation. So we could now proceed to the Q&A session of our panel. But before uh, you ask your questions, allow me to just briefly summarize the presentations, also to give you time to organize your thoughts or formulate your questions. So our first presentation is about uh, the wholesalers, uh, vegetable wholesalers in La Trinidad, and what are their responses towards the modernizing project or, uh, modernizing urban development project of La Trinidad. And professors uh, Milgram and Lori, uh, Lori Le Mendoza argued that they used advocacy politics and at the same time everyday politics to negotiate okay. their position with the uh, government or with the local government. The second pre presentation is about uh, how many are the poor in the Cordillera and our presenter, Mr. Uh, Bahit, proceeded to show us the statistics regarding the poverty incidence in the Cordillera administrative region. And the thing that I wanted to highlight in his presentation is that according to Mr. Bahit Jr., uh, the poverty could affect sustainability. Sustainability in terms of environmental sustainability and cultural sustainability. That's why it is important for local government units to solve uh, poverty in the region. The last presentation is about the history of the BLIST uh, presented by uh, Ms. Gray. And he showed us the uh, timeline, the historical timeline of the development of the BLIST concept uh, in, <clears throat> among uh, the different towns in the BLIST. And the conclusion that he, the question that he tried to answer is the question of who gets to define the development concept in this bliss concept. And the answer of Ms. Gray is that it's basically top down. You have your uh, political and bureaucratic institutions defining what development is in the, in the concept of the bliss. Although there are attempts also from the grassroots level to participate in the develop in the conceptualization of the development of the BLIST project. So that's it for the summary. So if you have any questions uh, to our pres presenters, you can raise your hand and I can call you or you can post your question in our chat box. So while, while, our, while our audience are gathering their thoughts, perhaps I could raise my question first. So, so my question is uh, directed to professors Milgram and Mendoza about their paper. Uh, your paper is entitled uh, Rethinking Appropriate Urban Development, Advocating for Alternatives in a Philippine Wholesale Market Trade. So am I correct in, in my interpretation that this alternative, uh, this alternative in the Philippine wholesale market trade that you are trying to explore is more appropriate than the modernizing concept of urban development of the local government. In other words, I'm wondering whether you are proposing a different conception of urban development. And it seems to me that you are, since you mentioned that we need to look for a more inclusive and diverse uh, notion of urban development that does not exclude those informal whole vegetable wholesale market uh, traders. And if so, what, what is that notion of development that you are trying to forward in this alternative? Uh, okay, can you hear me? Thank you for your question. Yeah, uh, thank you for your question. Um, I think you've sort of answered it as you were asking it. And the, you know, the idea is to make room in any initiative for all the stakeholders. And so what uh, Professor Mendoza and I were talking about is the idea of the larger 
for example, Baptiste site, going for a main, you know, a mainstream model that does not benefit all of the levels of stakeholders who are involved. So the alternative is listen to what people's needs are and try to answer the needs of, of people working at different levels rather than thinking of just the large stakeholders and what's going to maximize profits. Thank you, and, Professor, for that answer. But I don't know if Professor Mendoza wants to <laughs> yes, chime Professor in on that Mendoza. as well. Um, I will just add, can you hear me? I hope I am yeah, Yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. Uh, I think what probably can be stressed after you have seen the three presentations is that our presentation is trying to let you look at how, what, what the view is from those who actually participate mm -hmm. or do activities that end up being called development activities or that create development outcomes. So, you know, you, you have the story of the trader, what he does, what she, what kinds of relationships he, she will have to nurture in order to be able to do that activity. So you have a, 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 a micro or personal level perspective of what is going on from their point of view. The two other presentations are more the, you know, the planner's viewpoint, the macroeconomist or the macro uh, viewpoint and trying to look at the development process after it has already been produced by act real activities, by real people on the ground. And perhaps that's an important perspective to keep when we talk about development. You have to always try to look at those two viewpoints because they give you very different pictures, not necessarily conflicting ones, but they broaden what you ought to do as a policymaker. Thank you. Can I, can I have a brief follow up on your answers? Just a curious question about the notion of uh, appropriateness, because the notion of appropriateness is a normative notion. And I'm wondering if your paper uh, merely uh, conceptualizes appropriateness in terms of it's economically appropriate. It's economically appropriate to include these, uh, these informal sellers, or are you also forwarding a, a moral argument for the inclusion of these wholesale trailers. So is it, is it just economically appropriate or also morally appropriate? And if, more, if there's a moral dimension, what exactly is this moral dimension that could back up that kind of uh, extra legal uh, actions from this, these wholesale tra traders? Uh, Lynn, you, you first. <laughs> Okay. Uh, well, the, the, uh, the, the issue of appropriate is sort of in quotation marks, like appropriate, yeah. exactly, appropriate for who? So it's appropriate for some model that, again, does not consider the complexity of the situation. So it needs to be really appropriate for the on-the-ground situation, the number of people involved in this particular trade and all of the niches that they've carved out and how to make it appropriate culturally, economically, morally to make sure that they have a viable livelihood. So the idea of appropriate is to problematize it and ask the question as you've identified, appropriate for who? So it is as Laura Lee mentioned that we're looking at the micro level and very often planning is macro and they forget about the people on the ground who are actually involved in these things. So how, you know, what is this going to work out to be and who is it appropriate for? I don't know if Laura Lee would like to add something to that. Um, well, I just like to add, if only to maybe make us say that, um, I'd like to argue that looking at it from an economic point of view does not mean it has no moral grounding. I think uh, people tend to think that when we say um, the economic outcomes that this not have that these do not have any moral connections, I think that's just one view. Uh, I, uh, as an economist, I believe that what we call economic, I really, it's just a description of certain activities that we have segregated to be or to be called economic. But I think once we talk about what is moral or what is, I think that that is really. That is always there, even in the economic activity that we do. 
it is anchored on certain moral uh, beliefs. So um, maybe the question is not economic versus the others. I think uh, I am of the belief that economic activities are always embedded in social life. And the values that prevail, even in the economic activities, arise from the social cultural, uh, what you would call moral structure in which it is embedded. It is not a uh, separate. Maybe you can say uh, capitalist versus non-capitalist. Then there you are talking about some difference in terms of how we want to organize economic activity. But anyway, uh, I'm not I'm not in agreement with people who tend to separate this and distinguish mm -hmm. this. I am more for looking at it as always embedded in social and cultural activities. Good. Yeah. Thank you for your answers, uh, professors. Uh, there, here, there's a question in the chat box for uh, Ma'am Jiraya. Let me just read it. What was the counter proposal of the locals, if any, against the Blist proposal, since you have mentioned that they did not agree with it? Thank you. And that's actually a really good question. Um, in the post, okay, so we're looking at the, we can look at the pre-1990 earthquake scenario and the post-1990 earthquake scenario. Uh, pre-1990 earthquake, we have something called the, what is, I think it was the Comprehensive Development Plan for Baguio or something like that from 1972, but it wasn't used either. But the same people who worked on the Bliss plan, like architect Joseph Alabanza, were the same people who worked on the 1972 plan. So that's one proposal which emerged in the aftermath of the 1990 earthquake and people were like okay we already have a plan from 1972 and because they had learned about the blist for the first time they were thinking why can't we just follow the plan from 1972 why do you have to make a new one but there was a lot of confusion see in the um aftermath of of the earthquake so and plans na lumalabas. so that's from the more uh yun yung more formal plans now from the grassroots itself there was something called the baguio we want forum which emerged as like a citizen's initiative to define what it meant for people in Baguio to want development. But it was really more of a Baguio-based initiative. So any outcomes done? I think they had a two-day Congress. And then they had this very large document, which had a lot of proposals for the development of Baguio. But the problem with this is, remember I mentioned there's a stack of development context. So the Blist was important, not just for Baguio, but for Benguet, and then for the region, and then for national goals of regional development. Now, the problem of pursuing the admittedly more informal um, plans by the Baguio We Want Forum was that it was really more for Baguio rather than those wider scales. And so there were many meetings, like the newspaper accounts from the time really tell us a lot about these encounters where they would try to get the proposal accepted in City Hall and it would go through all of these loops so that's what happened to many of the plans. I can't remember what the others are now. They would go through the loops on the local level. And that was problematic because there are so many different things to clarify. While the Blist plan, which already had institutional sponsorship, went straight to the top, you know, for many reasons, not necessarily because it was being privileged, but partly because it was already in the loop to begin with. So what happened to those initial proposals? Um, the Baguio We Want plans, uh, are still kind of in in the in the ether. Uh, I think in 2016 there was this congress held again by the Baguio We Want Forum, and they're quite active in the Baguio scene. But uh, on the level of an urban development plan for Baguio and Benguet, there hasn't been, to my knowledge, at least a viable alternative that's fleshed out. It has to be fleshed out because how do you get your funding for what uh, zoning plans? You know, mga ganun -ganun. I'm not an economist, so I don't completely understand it either. But more or less, it's safe to say that no other urban development plan for Baguio and the surrounding environment has been able to stand up to the bliss uh, on the level of how complex it was. And this is not the fault of local initiatives. Imagine all the funding that came from the European community, uh, all of the expertise over a year of study that went into developing the bliss concept na last na pinasan ko kanina. So local initiatives, I think, don't really stand much of a chance in terms of how fleshed out they are because of a lack of these opportunities. And that's why policy planning windows are so important when we look at the development of these concepts through time. I hope that answers the question, but you can give me a follow up if I kind of went on a tangent there. Thank you. Thank you for your answer, Mam Jiraya. 
Uh, let me entertain this question from an anonymous participant <clears throat> directed to, to everyone, to the presenters. So let me just read it. To our presenters, given your own research inquiries, do you think the autonomy of the Cordillera will have a great impact in the development of the region? Right? So let me repeat it. To our presenters, given your own re research inquiries, do you think the autonomy of the Cordillera will have a great impact in the development of the region? So anyone could go first. Ma'am Laurie, you are on mute. No, I was going to say, Aldrin, you might want to be the first one to say something. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, yes, that definitely. Um, we're talking about poverty statistics and our basis for the measurement of poverty statistics is the monetary base based on the family income and expenditure survey. And um, we are as well the um, um, estimator or we estimate the economic accounts of the Cordillera and uh, it can, the autonomy actually would spur I believe uh, it would spur more economic development for the Cordillera administrative region. And this means that it would uh, help in more uh, income for our people in the Cordillera. So um, we are so wary on all the things that's happening in the Cordillera administrative region, um, whether your intellectual property, whether um, mining and uh, all those stuff. Just imagine uh, for for the information. I guess many of us know that already. That uh, uh, the banking uh, institutions here in the Cordillera they pay bulk of their taxes in in the national treasury in the national government um, through their through their central offices. Even our mining companies here, um, they pay their uh, taxes in Makati, in in Pasay. So uh, with with the uh, with um, econo uh, the uh, autonomy that we push for the Cordillera Administrative Region, we could get a, a bigger slice of, of that taxes. And and this. Uh, economic activities are being done here in the Cordillera administrative region. And yet uh, the fruits of those economic activities are uh, not fully realized here. And with uh, the, uh, well, in connection to my presentation in uh, trying to answer where the poor, um, yes, a uh, poor, uh, IPs here in the Cordillera, where it, where are the pockets of poverty? It's basically uh, also would be answered by the partly uh, directly or indirectly by the uh, autonomy issue of the Cordillera administrative region. So yes, uh, definitely autonomy, and our 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 uh, papers would uh, help. Um, um push for the uh, autonomy of the Cordillera administrative region. Thank you, Mr. Bahit, for your answer. Uh, anyone from the panel would still want to respond? respond. Yes, uh, Ma'am Jiraya. Um, so since I'm looking at the historical context and my main question was who gets to define development, of course, the the inherent bias that I have is we should be able to define uh, we should be able to define development uh, as grassroots stakeholders right so I can give a perspective from the early days of regional development planning in in the Cordilleras so right in 1987 nabuo po yung Cordillera administrative region and then in the next years they were setting up for the 1990 plebiscite to see if um, the components of the region would would say yes to being fully or not fully, to being autonomous. Now, we don't need to go through all of the details of that. What interests me is uh, during the interim period, there were actually two development bodies created for the Cordilleras. Yung isa is the regular one, which is created for your regular region. And this is called the Regional uh, Development Council. So the Regional Development Council is composed of 
governors and mayors at a certain point. And they should be the ones, along with the NEDA secretariat, to approve the regional development plans. Natin. Now, the second body created for CAR, because we were in an interim period, was called the Cordillera Executive Board. And this is the, the part, I think, which answers the question more directly. Under the CEB, you had a lot more representatives who were being... Um, who were part of the body specifically because they represented different indigenous issues. So you have stakeholders who are part of the private sector. Um, I think also uh, from NGOs, and then you also have your typical mayors, governors, pool. So the assumption is that if perhaps um, the CEB had been in charge of regional development plans or had been approving regional development plans for much longer, perhaps, and with more institutional teeth, maybe the regional development plans, such as the ones we analyzed earlier, or I analyzed, might have a deeper reflection of uh, what locals wanted. So for example, there was a time when the Benguet Provincial Board, composed of mayors from Benguet, said, no, we don't want the Bliss Plan. So perhaps if they had more representation in, in the body, then maybe that would have made it easier for both the technical secretariat and locals to uh, work together on making those proposals more tangible, more real, right? So I think I'm a little too young to make any definitive comments on whether or not that will be good for Cordillera and autonomy. But what I can say is that will increase the level of participation in these kinds of bodies. And it might, um, it might close the gap, so to speak. In that, in that tendency for there to be top-down planning. Yeah, the process might take a little longer, but perhaps it is these kinds of mechanisms which truly speak of a more participatory democracy. Thank you, Ma'am Jiraya, for, for that answer. And uh, as much as we still want to entertain other questions, I, I think we could end with that last question. So again, thank you to our presenters, Professors Milgram and Mendoza, Ma'am Jiraya and Sir Aldrin for your wonderful presentations. And of course, for our audience in this panel.